Hello everyone and hope you, everyone is having a wonderful fantastic day. Today, unlike usual, we are going to be talking about Baldur's Gate. We are st straying away from the Pokemon content for a bit. Sorry for the lack of uploads on that part, but I've been a little bit busy. But Baldur's Gate Patch 8 is here and there's a lot of awesome uh, things that they've told us so far. We don't have the definite um full explanations yet but based on what they said we're going to kind of speculate and see what to expect and what kind of builds that you can do so let's go ahead and kind of look at what's going on here okay so um in the patch they talked about crossplay um picture mode 12 new subclasses and then we're gonna talk about some multi-classing ideas and predictions based on what we might expect okay um, so for the crossplay, there's gonna be ability to play between different platforms. Pretty simple: PC, Mac, Xbox, PS5. You can invite directly using the Larian network. That's about all we have so far. Should be pretty obvious. Um, but yeah, you may need to create their account. Uh, before, it wasn't very required to, and even now, it's not very required to uh, sign into their account and everything to play. But uh, if you want to play between different platforms, you are going to want to have uh, the account. Okay, next, the photo mode. Uh, so there's just a bunch of stuff they can do. You can use the photo booth to take, sh uh, you know, pictures, take shots. Um, there's some ways to customize and edit in-game photography. Um, so there's a, uh, you can take out some of these things, um, like from when while you're adventuring while you're in combat while you're in dialogue and while you're in cinematic scenes so there's different uh things that you could take pictures of basically every part of the game you could take a picture of um and you use it by uh there's like a toggled thing on the hud or you can use a hotkey and then there's gonna be a bunch of lens settings to change the field of view the exposure the depth of field and focus like as if you're taking a real picture um, and then there's gonna be some scene settings uh, where you toggle different types of characters. Um, so it, whether it's NPC, your en uh, the enemies, party, whatever. So you can just take pictures of just the thing or the people that you want. Um, yeah, and then there's gonna be some post-processing effects to make your pictures look really cool. Um, basically this is color grading. You can change the contrast, the saturation, you can highlight certain things, you can change the brightness, and you can add different things like vignette. Um, and then there's gonna be some frames that you can choose uh, from. Um, so they, they probably include some pretty interesting cool f uh, frames, but this is all like just added on top of the picture so you can just use any other kind of photo editor to do these things. Same thing with stickers, there's gonna be a bunch of stickers they can add on top. Um, most importantly, there's gonna be cat ears. So that's the biggest thing, adding cat ears. Okay, so got, got over those little things and now we'll get into the main meat of this update. Larian did not need to add all of these subclasses considering that they said they're not gonna do any more any DLCs. Not anymore. They don't have any DLCs. This is a DLC uh, level worth of content and they just decided, you know what? Everyone can have this. Everyone's gonna get this. We said we weren't gonna do any more updates, but they did. And um... Yeah, so they have a bunch of new subclasses that are coming in the in patch 8. It's just going to be free and there's some awesome classes. So we're going to go through each of them alphabetically and um, hopefully there's some new subclasses that you like. So the first one is Barbarian Path of the Giants. Okay, so here uh, we're uh, as we go through this... Um, as we go through these uh, patch notes, we're going to have what is currently in the D&D 5e. Uh, fifth edition and then we're gonna look at what they said that you're gonna get and then we're gonna compare kind of what might be there and what what isn't there um, what we can expect in terms of how they're gonna um, how they're going to implement these things so right now at level three uh, for barbarian path of the giants you get you get level three giants power you learn giant or another language if you know it so Probably won't really come into play just because they don't really speak other languages in the, in the game. It's all in uh, English. They, the language proficiencies aren't really a big thing. But uh, importantly, you might be you can learn Druidcraft or Thaumaturgy, which can be, you know, it's, it's kind of flavorful. I don't think they do anything in-game right now. 
Um, aside from Thaumaturgy, I think actually I believe Thaumaturgy gives you advantage on like intimidation checks and such. So um, there might be some useful things there. Um, and then at level three, you'll also get one when you rage, you get crushing throw, which means you add rage damage to the thrown weapon damage. So if you wanted to do a third wing build, this is something you can do. And then giant stature, you um, your reach increases and you become large. Now this can be a little bit more important in terms of um, uh, size restrictions. Uh, I believe for throwing enemies, there's some size restrictions. Uh, I'm not exactly sure on the rule, but they can't be too big. So if you if you can grow large, you can grab uh, enemies. You should be able to grab almost all of them. I think maybe the dragon and stuff you you won't be able to grab or throw. Um, there isn't really a grappling mechanic in uh, BG3, so that's not gonna be a big thing but in terms of throwing enemies that is something so um and then at level six you get elemental cleaver which infuses your weapon with primordial yeah primordial energy so, um which just means like basically you um get rid of like weapon resistances uh from non-magical attacks so if they have resistances from magical attacks, then that's still the thing. But uh, this really helps. Uh, but then again, like most weapons in D and D, after you know, after a few levels, is going to be magical. They usually have like a plus one at the very least, uh, unless you're picking some random weapon. Um, that being said, if you're throwing random weapons, um, such as uh, yeah, so it. <sighs> Later, you'll you'll see why it doesn't matter. But it, um, normally, when you f when you do lots of throwing stuff, like you have a bunch of daggers or spears in your inventory, um, they're you know you, they're most likely not going to ma be magical because you don't want to lose them and such. That being said, uh, as you see later, um, when you have elemental cleaver, the throwing weapon returns back to your hand. Um, so it's really not gonna matter. This uh, basically triggers when you rage, you choose between all of these elemental stuff, acid, cold, fire, thunder, lightning. The important mechanical advantage here is you always can look and see what kind of vulnerabilities enemies might have. So you can, uh, when you, once you do so, before you rage, check it and then you can say, okay, well this enemy is weak to cold, choose cold damage. And that'll do double damage, so that could be very useful. Uh, it's gonna be six level investments in terms of multi-classing, so um, this is gonna be um, kind of difficult to do unless you want the ma your main class is going to be barbarian. Um, it adds an extra one d six damage. Um, I don't. I think it's per attack, so that's gonna be a pretty big damage bump. It's like having um, what is it? Uh, Hunter's mark or hex. So that's pretty good. Um, and the weapon you're holding gains uh, th the throwing property, it returns to your hand, which is nice. And you can use your bonus actions to change uh, weapon damage types. So say you kill the enemy with the cold uh, vulnerability, and then the ones that are left have fire vulnerability. Well, then you can switch that, right? Um, so not too bad, only a bonus action to change. Um, won't always be optimal, but uh, it's, pro it's going to help you more than not. Okay, and then at level 10, um, you have Mighty Impel, which uh, is used to hurl allies or foes. Um, it takes only a bonus action while raging, and then um, it's so it's medium or smaller creature. Small creature is thrown within 30 feet, um, and the, it, they have to, uh, the DC is the 8 plus proficiency plus your strength modifier. So you can already hurl allies or foes in BG3. That's not a big thing. Uh, this has... A, a, a range restriction of 30 feet so that probably won't exist if it's in the game um, and if you're large you could probably throw up to large uh, or one size bigger um, I'm not sure why they make you become large in D&D &D and then you can only th throw medium or smaller I guess just because they don't have the throwing kind of mechanic they have grappling mechanics uh, which allows for up to one size larger uh, in this case, they'll probably let you throw at up to your same size. So if you're large, you could probably throw large. That's how it's gonna go. Um, and what Larian had said in patch in their patch eight notes is uh, giant's rage passive. It's gonna give you size, uh, which makes sense. It's gonna give you strength and additional throw damage. So as we've seen, the throw damage is probably part of the elemental cleaver if they have that. Uh, it's a par pretty powerful little feature here. Um, 
because as we know, uh, most barbarians they don't really scale very well into later games in terms of damage. But um, this adds a lot of damage and, and flexibility in terms of their damage type. So that could be really good. Um, but uh, and, and in terms of strength, what they have said is that you will no longer need to you know instead of chugging potions like you know or elixirs in this case, right? The elixir of giant strength. Or, or a hill giant and cloud uh, giant strength. Um, they're saying instead of doing that, I don't know if it's gonna be like as strong as those because some of them give what that one gives 24 uh, strength or sets your strength to 24, and the other one sets your strength to 27, which is really big. Um, that is a huge modifier. If you can get that with like a three level dip or something, that is just gonna be way too, too strong. Um, so I'm wondering if if instead of setting it, it's going to increase your maximum and give you some. So they're going to say, say you, uh, they, uh, they're probably going to maybe give you a proficiency number of, uh, of strength on top of what you have, which will give you up to probably plus three. I believe uh, the proficiency bonus at level 12 is six. Uh, so if you get 6 added on top of if you say you have 20, then that'll be 26. Um, you don't really need 27 because that wouldn't actually change anything. Um, which means that that would end up being, uh, instead of plus 5, it'll be a plus 8. So still a pretty huge change. Um, but I doubt that they'll give you 27 strength at level 1, 2, or 3. Or, uh, yeah, level 3. That seems a little bit too in uh, insane, unless it's something they plan on giving at a later level. Um, and then the other thing is that your carrying capacity will increase. Um, in quote, they said yeet friend or foe. So that's definitely their level 10 feature, but that's probably going to be available from the beginning. Um, but maybe at level 10, you can do it as a bonus action. Um, and in terms of game mechanics, barbarian stuff is pretty easily translatable. Um, it, you don't, they don't really need to change too much aside from maybe their giant's power um, passive. It might not even exist. They might have combined it into Giant's Rage, these two things. Um, so we'll see if they get to, they let you learn a cantrip here. This is kind of a good uh, advantage, good thing to have, to, uh, advantage in conversations. Uh, in BG3, you can even avoid uh, the whole fight if you have advantage and you use your intimidation. Um, an advantage uh, lets you pass so many checks, uh, especially with all the inspirations that you have. Um, and then, uh, so they're probably going to let you grow in size at level 3, and um, at, maybe at level 6 they'll give you additional throw damage, or they'll have it scale. So they'll give it to you at level 3, but then it'll scale at level 6 again. Um, and then, uh, they haven't said anything about the elemental cleaver uh, feature in terms of infusing your weapon with primordial energy. Um, I don't see why they wouldn't give it to you. It's, it's a decently powerful feature, but it's also not completely broken. Um, and it gives you that fun, um, fun, uh, little, like, fantasy of just barbarian throwing weapons, um, and doing this kind of primordial stuff. Uh, very likely they're going to let it so that even though you're throwing weapons and it's kind of, it's a ranged, uh, attack, that you're gonna keep your, um, you're gonna be able to keep... The, uh, the rage going, that would be very important. Unless, uh, if not, it would be weird to be able to uh, attack. Like, if you have to melee attack a couple times and then throw something, that seems a little bit weird to me. So, hopefully that is the case. Because otherwise, you would have disadvantage on those throws. Um, and potentially, what they will allow you to do is um, uh, they'll let you use a Reckless Rage. Uh, reckless Attack, sorry. Reckless Attack. Uh, to gain advantage even on thrown attacks because that is Barbarian's main thing, but it only works on melee attacks. So, in this case, they will most likely give you that advantage. Okay, uh, so that's mostly it for that one. Let's go to the next one, which is Bard. So, Bard College of Glamour is the next one. So, level 3, Mantle of Inspiration. Uh, it costs one Bardic Inspiration to do it. Um, you use your bonus action to choose up to a Charisma no a mod number of creatures. So uh, I believe that's a minimum of one to gain temporary HP. So that can include yourself, I believe. Uh, those creatures immediately use their reaction to move up to their speed. And it doesn't provoke opportunity attacks. So um, 
This could be very useful in the game, for example, when you get stuck next to, um, what are those things called? The little, the, not, they're not little, those giant, um, oh, what are they called? Uh, those giant, like, robots at the end, basically, uh, where they explode. Um, so if, uh, you, you know that sometimes you could trigger the explosion early, but then, like, you, your teammate has already gone, uh, so they're, it, it's past their initiative order. But you know that it's going to explode before it gets to their turn. Well, in that case, you could probably use this to help them move out of reach. So in that case, there would have not, not been opportunity attacks. But there's things like that where it would actually matter. Um, or if you want to explode a barrel or something, but their teammates nearby, you can use this as a bonus action first to, um, to have them move out of the way before you explode that. Okay, and... Um, it increases to 8 and 11 at level 5 and level 10, it looks like. Uh, what, the, what does it increase? The, the, oh, the temp HP increases to 8 and then 11. Uh, let's see. The temp HP, I believe, is 5 at, at, at early on. Um, yeah. Okay, and then at level 3, you also get enthralling performance. It's once per short rest. After 1 minute of performance, choose humanoids up to number of charisma modifier to be charmed. Uh, no hit of charm if it fails. So that's very important if they don't turn hostile, even in honor mode. Uh, that's something that we want to make sure that, you know, certain people don't turn hostile. Okay. And then level 6, we have Mantle of Majesty. It's once per long rest. It's bonus action to cast command without using spell slots. And it's a 1 minute duration, plus it requires concentration just like a spell. We've seen that happen with other features in the game, so it's no surprise, but it will require concentration. That being said, being able to cast command every turn is pretty good without any spell slots. And then if charmed, uh, it auto if they are already charmed, say, from enthralling performance, they auto automatically fail against command from Mantle of Majesty. So that could be very useful. Um, you can have them do anything instead of having to make uh, those saves. So making uh, enemies fail this enthralling performance would be really important normally. Now in patch 8 notes, they say that man they talk about Mantle of Inspiration. It's 5 temporary HP. They get charmed. Uh, and then it's being used in battle. So Mantle of uh, Mantle of Inspiration is not a... Uh, is this feature up here, but... Um, it doesn't have anything to, to do with being charmed. So what they might be doing is combining these two features together and calling it Mantle of Inspiration. And so, um, yeah, you do some something and then you give your allies temp HP and then it charms maybe enemies. So it's kind of a buff and debuff caused at the same time. And then they also say that uh, they also mention Mantle of Majesty. So it looks like they're going to try to implement this exactly. Uh, and then after this, bards don't really get any more features. A lot of uh, subclasses for full casters aren't like super big because they get spells. Um, yeah, so it looks like they'll implement it by combining these two together. Um, and so that you can use it during battle. Because one, uh, one minute of performance is kind of weird. You're going to have to sit there and just like perform. Um, which it's not useful at all in combat, so... Uh, it looks like that's what's going to happen there. Um, okay. So next is Cleric. It's the Death Domain. Um, so currently in 5th uh, edition, you get a bunch of spells that are always prepared. D &D, uh, what is it? Baldur's Gate 3 also, also does this. Um, this is Cleric levels, by the way. It is not 9th level spell. So at first level, you get first uh, false life, ray of sickness. At third level, you get blindness or de uh, slash deafness, ray of enfeeblement. Uh, fifth level, animate dead, vampiric touch. Seventh level, blight, death ward. Ninth level, anti-life shell and cloud kill. Not like a crazy set of uh, spells, but also, uh, you know, not bad. Uh, vampiric touch can be useful. Animate Dead is, is useful, always creating more allies so that you have more action economy and more targets for the enemies to hit instead of you. Uh, that could be very important there. 
and then it, and then uh, importantly you get a proficiency in all martial weapons so that could be very useful especially because death domain tends to be more melee focused um, and then at level one you get the Reaper um, feature which is you gain one necromancy cantrip you're most likely going to take toll the dead um, and then necromancy cantrips with one target becomes two if they're next to each other so it kind of becomes a small AoE uh, up to two creatures um, you know kind of useful kind of not I mean it's it doesn't really help focus one down but sometimes there's something that's kind of weak and you don't want to use your one spell at him well if they're next to someone then you could do something or you could force some kind of movement maybe you push them and then use uh use it and then they are next to each other okay level two your channel divinity option is uh, touch of death um so it costs the channel divinity um and when you hit melee uh when you hit with your melee attack you can use channel divinity to deal five plus two times your cleric level damage so at level 12 this is gonna add up to uh 29 damage plus your melee weapon attack uh which is not nothing that's a big burst the only problem with uh clerics really is that they only get one attack so if you miss you miss you don't get another chance um, and I don't think there's really a good way for clerics to gain advantage. So, um, you know, death domain clerics aren't really, they're, they're up in front as a tank, but they're not really doing damage to like barbarians. They're just up there disrupting, uh, every once in a while they can cast something like, uh, they use something like this to get a big hit. Um, but really they're just up there, uh, assisting allies and trying to take as much damage as possible. Uh, even though they don't have any damage resisting stuff, they will have high armor class, so that's one way to do it, because, you know... Uh, actually, I don't know if Death Clerics gain um, heavy armor proficiency, because they gain martial weapon, but they will definitely have medium armor proficiency at the very least. Okay, and then at level 6, Inescapable Destruction, Cleric Spells, uh, or uh, Channel Divinity uh, ignores Necrotic Resistance, so you know that you're not going to have any resistance when you use that. You know you're going to get... Um, 29 damage at the very least um and then at level 8 you gain divine strike it's once per turn weapon attack deals 1d8 necrotic damage so another 1d8 added onto um the 29 that you can do well 29 at level 12 so at level 8 what is that 16 21 added damage so uh weapon damage plus 1d8 plus 21 so that's not nothing that's actually uh decent if it hits um I, if you go up to level 8 on uh, Cleric, there is no way for you to get another, uh, you know, go into another class to get a extra attack. Because it takes at least 5 levels to do so. Um, and you only have 4 levels left. So you would, if you wanted to have your channel divinity thing, you would have to give up this divine strike feature. Uh, the only other option for you to uh, have this is if you had... A, a, an offhand weapon then you can get two weapons uh, two attacks per turn um, but we'll talk more about different um, multi-classing options later in uh, the video now in the patch 8 it says uh, that you're gonna get you're going to get necrotic spells and three new cantrips so one of those being told the dead and then you can explode corpses um, so what does this look like uh, in this case? Maybe uh, it looks like they might become a little bit more AOE focused necrotic damage uh, with um, uh, with being able to uh, animate dead maybe um, and just trying to swarm the enemy if possible with yourself and one other um, animated uh, you know creature and then kind of ex you can explode corpses so maybe the ones that you kill with this or other dead ones you can explode them. There's a good chance that that becomes their level 8 feature or, um, yeah, I can, I can see that being maybe a feature of, like, Toll the Dead. If, like, there's one, one alive and one dead next to it or something, you can explode it. Uh, or anything that dies from your necrotic da um, damage explodes. Um, so that'll probably be added as maybe a level 1 feature if it, if it can explode and do some AoE damage. Um... And we don't, and we have no idea if that'll affect ally, uh, affect allies or not. Um, but hopefully it won't. Um, yeah, that seems mostly like it'll be fine. All of this stuff seems to be pretty easily transferable. Uh, not, I don't know how how effective this uh, cantrip thing, the Reaper feat, will be with trying to hit two people. They're not always right next to each other. Um, 
It is Toll the Dead is a ranged spell, but it is a save saving throw. Um, I want to say that's it's a wisdom, wisdom saving throw. Um, but you basically because it is a saving throw, there won't be any disadvantage if you're close to them, which is good. Um, so this, uh, there's and if you're going melee, there's a good chance that you know you will have maybe two three people kind of swarming you. So in that case, this might come in handy. We'll see. Uh, it, it could make up for the fact that you don't get two attacks. And we know that, uh, and you can't, the issue with the death domain is, as a cleric, is that you can't also gain one level, what, two levels in, um, the war domain, which would give you a bonus action attack. If you use this cantrip, um, you will not have any actions to use your melee attack, so that's not super useful unless they allow you to use a weapon attack on your bonus action. The only other way to really uh, be able to achieve this is if you have an offhand weapon, uh, which is possible, that might allow you to do that. Um, in Baldur's Gate 3, it doesn't matter if your hands are full to cast somatic spells or spells with somatic components. Um, so that's probably going to be fine. Um, but that being said, you will have to use some sort of offhand type of light-handed weapon instead of the, the classic cleric mace, you know, or two-handed weapon. Um, the other, uh, I don't know if... I want to say with Great Weapon Master, you have to use your weapon attack for you to get the bonus action attack. So, um, but if bon if if you can take the uh, Great Weapon Master feat and gain a bonus action after killing an enemy, that's kind of potentially how you can get your bonus action attack. That being said, you're not going to reliably get kills with your can trips um, during your turn. So, you know, take that with what you will. It the pr probably the best way to guarantee having a bonus action attack so that you can use your channel divinity so you can use your divine strike will be to have an offhand weapon so get daggers get rapiers things like that or scimitars you do have proficiency in all martial weapons so you may be able to do something like that it's a little funky to be to to spell and then offhand attack um but you know clerics are not meant to do a lot of generally clerics don't do a lot of melee damage um, they have a lot of useful utility spells, so this won't be your main form of thing, but you can add a little bit. You can have some burst, um, and it's pretty reliable if it resists um, necrotic damage, so or if it doesn't get affected by necrotic resistance. Okay, so next will be Druid. It's going to be the Circle of Stars, which is a pretty strong subclass. So in, there's, there's going to be a ton here, so in the current 5th uh, edition, at level 2, you get Star Map, which teaches you Guidance Cantrip. That could be very useful, because, you know, everybody wants Guidance in Baldur's Gate. And you can add it in every single uh, conversation. You always have Guiding Bolt prepared. That's really nice. Um, Guiding Bolt could be very useful, um, and, and you'll see why a little bit uh, later on. And then you can use the Guiding Bolt without using a spell slot, prof uh, proficiency, proficiency number of times per long rest. Now I don't know if that means that you can cast it at only level 1, or if you can cast if you can upcast it without using a spell slot. Because um, that would be pretty broken to be able to use Guiding Bolt with, you know, your highest level 6 slot without using a spell slot. So we'll see how they uh, do that. It would be a pretty potent combo if you can do that, uh, as you will see. Because at level 2, um, yes, that's, you also get the sorry form feature. You use your wild sheep charge to do it, so you'll be able to do it a few times before um, and before a long rest, I believe. Um, and you use bonus action and you shed bright light for 10 minutes, um, which, um, if you don't have dark vision, could be useful, uh, when especially in Act 2, but not, you know, not something significant, really. Uh, and then you get to choose a form between Archer, Chalice, and Dragon. Now, Archer gives you bonus action ranged attack. It's going to be a 1d8 plus your Wisdom uh, Radiant damage. Now, the reason why this might be used uh, with... I guess not the reason, but the way this could potentially be com comboed is you use your Guiding Bolt that, you get you, that you're given that, and that you have prepared. And then that gives you advantage on your ranged attack, the 1d8 plus your Wisdom modifier damage so you could you could potentially just do that combo over and over um you're not always going to hit your second attack um or, or your your first attack which is the guiding bolt and then you might hit your ranged attack you might not but then when you do hit your guiding bolt you're very likely going to hit your ranged attack from your archer form 
Uh, so that's kind of like the damage route. Um, the awkward thing for Druid doing that is the Guiding Bolt will end up being... I uh, will end up taking your full action instead of... Uh, normally you have two uh, actions, or not two actions, two attacks at level 5 uh, in your Wild Sheet form. So that would mean that uh, just one attack, one attack, that feels a little bit weird. Um, if you take the Archer form, you might even prefer having two attacks during your action and then the bonus action range attack. Um, hopefully what they kind of try to do is they let you use this bonus uh, bonus action range attack as your regular attacks and then you can use Guiding Bolt as a bonus action. That would end up being pretty powerful, but it would synergize much better than what they have here. Um, okay, and then your second form Chalice. When you use healing spells, you, you can choose yourself or another ally to heal an extra 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier. Um... It's it's a little it could be useful to help down uh help downed allies, uh multiple downed allies. So you're you you see that you have um two allies down. You can heal one. You can uh have them come back into action. Uh and then uh heck have both of them come back into action. So that could potentially be useful. It's uh it lets you use single target healing spells to heal two people. Uh, as you know uh, in Baldur's Gate. Healing people up from uh from zero health is not as useful as it is in D and D fifth edition, uh because in D and D once you're up you can you can you have all of your resources uh but then in Baldur's Gate uh when once you're healed you only have your bonus action it's not that useful but it is potentially another target that the enemies will be distracted with when that happens and they'll attack that uh, ally again. Uh, if not, they'll attack you, and then you'll uh, that ally has a, a bonus action round to heal themselves. Okay, and then if you have the dragon form, if you choose a dragon one, all of your intelligence, wisdom checks, uh, and and then concentration checks. If you roll a nine or lower, it is a ten. So that is a decently useful feature if you really want to be concentrating on something, um, and uh. Yeah, so if you want to maintain concentration, that is very useful. And uh, when you're fighting, uh, what is it, mind flayers and such, there's going to be lots of intelligence and wisdom checks uh, that you want to pass. Uh, so you'll never be effect, uh, you'll never lose the, you'll never get like hold personed or and such and mind flayed and what, what's it called again? I, I don't remember the all their psychic spells, but that'll be pretty useful. Uh, give me one second here and take a drink. So yeah, that'll that'll end up being potentially very uh, useful. That being said, it's not a very offensive option. Um, you still get your two attacks uh, during this time. You might want to use uh, when you're in your dragon form. You might want to have uh, Shillelagh or something so that you can actually do something in your turn. Now at level six, you gain the Cosmic Omen feature. Um, after long rest until next long rest, you gain special reactions. So, um, you roll a dice, and if it's uneven, then you get wheel. If it's odd, you get woe. As you can see here, the uh, you use your reaction to add um, for wheel. You use your reaction to add one d six to your attack saving through ability or ability check. Um, with this is not damage. I believe the the add one d six to your attack means that your chance to hit not actually the damage portion but that is still useful um that translates to dps in the end and uh it can keep yourself safe uh Wo will use reaction to subtract 1d6 to your uh from the enemy's attack saving throw or ability check so you can kind of combine uh, use these if you have Wo, you can make enemies fail saving throws that could be potentially very useful um if you want them to uh you know and then and if you really don't like, you know, if you roll uh, even and you want it odd, you can try to take another long rest or something. You, it, it'll take you some extra resources, some camping supplies to do so. But once uh, once you get this, you're, you can guarantee it against the boss, make them lose 1d6 against the saving throw. That might be important. It takes a reaction only, so you can choose when to use it. Um, and you can use a proficiency number of times per long rest. So that's uh, not bad at all. 
Of course, you only get one reaction per round, so it'll be once per round for as many times as your proficiency number of times. And then at level 10, you get Twinkling Constellations that basically buffs the, some of the stuff that you have. Uh, mainly, uh, I believe as a bonus action, you can change your form each turn. And then the Archer damage goes from 1d8 to 2d8. Not a huge bump, um, but still useful. Dragon, you get Fly Speed and Hover. Uh, so once you have hover, I don't know how they're gonna really do hover because you can't hover high up in the air You're just considered floating which means um, You're not you're probably not going to be affected by things on the ground um, Flying speed doesn't matter too much necessarily unless you decide not to go half illithid Because uh, once you become half illithid you can fly around everywhere. So um, it's not a big deal um, That being said if you want to do a run where you don't take any illithid powers, then this could be useful um, I don't, I, I, I would say you, I would say like you want to try to have, if you have, if, if you're taking the dragon form, you want to have a constant, uh, something you're concentrating on that's really strong, but I can't really think of something that would be really useful, um, in terms of being, uh, having the concentration there, um, other than maybe like spirit guardians, but you don't, I don't, I don't believe you get spirit guardians. So that's one thing where if you do get spirit guardians and you can fly and you can just fly around everywhere and touch everyone and make them take damage, that could be very useful. But otherwise, I don't see this feature being super useful. Okay. And in the patch eight notes, they say you're going to get three star reforms. So archer, radiant damage, astral arrows, chalice, restore HP to you plus others. So potentially a bit more AoE than just two people here. And then Dragon, you can add damage plus and then add to your constitution rolls. So that's something. Uh, for some reason, Dragon form, they say, is going to add damage. So I don't know if maybe they're going to give you a breath spin or something. Or um, you can add damage to your attacks. Maybe the Dragon one will be like a melee version and an Archer will be the ranged version, uh, which could be pretty useful. So if you take the Archer, you try to do the Guiding Bolt or two ranged attacks plus the Astral Arrows. And then for Dragons, you go melee, maybe use Shalele, and then just use uh, two attacks, you know? And then maybe a Breath Weapon, who knows? So uh, we'll see how they implement that. Um, Cosmic Omen seems pretty random. So, uh, and you have it's something you have to remember to cast in the morning every time after a long rest. I don't, I, I don't know if they're going to keep this feature. They may change to something else. They might give you the Twinkling Constellations at level 6. Uh, in which case, you could take like uh, 5 or 6 levels in Cleric to get that Spirit Guardians. That could be useful. Um, and then uh, they have maybe another level 10 feature, like giving you Dragon Breath or something. That's very likely that what they'll do is they'll give you these three forms. And then every time you have your feature, it's just going to upgrade it a little bit. Um... Yeah, but then it looks like the the, uh, the dragon form is going to go from more resisting different uh, re uh, intelligence, wisdom, and concentration checks to just uh, more damage, melee focused, plus constitution rolls, which will be useful because if you're melee, you want to keep your concentration. Okay, next up is fighter. They're going to give you the arcane archer, which is a very interesting choice because arcane archer is um, a little bit lackluster as a as an option in dnd 5e but there's some cool options that you could potentially get so we'll see here what uh what's gonna happen so currently at level three arcane archer uh the arcane archer lore gives you the prest prestidigitation whoa okay sorry that one's always the first time i see it is always wrong prestidig prestidigitation okay or druid craft cantrip um so Prestidigitation could... I don't think it really does anything. I believe it cleans you. Yeah, I believe it like lets you clean things. So I don't know if that's going to be super useful. Uh, they'll probably give it to you just because. And then at level 3 again, the other feature you get is Arcane Shot. And you have to use 2 per short rest. Which is not much. To uh, I would say. Uh, 2 per short rest seems like kind of crazy low. So... Between long rests, you might get uh, about six shots in. Uh, there's, uh, they're basically, if that stays the way it, it's going to be, it says, uh, it's very likely going to end up becoming something like proficiency number of times per short rest, because that is way too little. Um, 
Yeah, either that or maybe like dexterity modifier per short rest, something like that. So basically, the main thing is at level 3, you gain, you learn two arcane shot options. And I've listed the arcane shot options on the right there. Um, you get, and then it increases the three uses at level 7, four uses at level 10. Um, at level 10, that's too few. Um, so we'll see what happens there. That being said, arcane shots, it's not something you would apply every time because it's something after you hit, you can choose to apply a certain arcane shot. And so before we get to our level 7 feature, let's actually look at some of the arcane shot options. Options. Uh, sorry, I don't know why I said it like that. Um, but yeah, so let's look at... So there's... Uh, they might not have all of these options, but there's some ones that are more likely to exist. Um, so first of all, banishing. It lets you banish the target, move, it to, move them to a different plane it can, until the end of that target's next turn. So you can have them lose a full turn. Um, yeah. And that could end up being pretty useful. Uh, Beguiling, it does 2d6 sack damage. And then you can charm, uh, that target by an, by an ally. So, they're not charmed to you, they're charmed to, the, to an ally, which is kind of weird. I don't know why that is super useful. Um, when, why they, I don't know why they wouldn't just say they're charmed to you. Maybe just because they've been shot by your arrow, <laughs> they don't, they wouldn't be charmed by you. I don't know, something like that. Okay, um, and then the next option is Bursting Arrow. Uh, it does 2d6 force damage in a 10 foot radius, so a little AoE option. Enfeebling, enfeebling is 2d6 ne additional necrotic damage as well. Um, and it does uh, target's weapon attack damage is halved until your next turn, so could be useful if you're going against weapon using enemies. And then grasping ones is 2d6 poison damage per turn if moving one foot or more. So if they decide to move at all, it will they, they will take 2d6 poison damage each turn. So uh, theoretically, that's the most damage you can do using the arcane shots is each round that they take 2d6. Because um, so it, it lasts for one minute, which is going to be the whole combat basically. And it takes a full action to remove it. So they may take that action, but if you, you make them use their action to remove that uh, arrow, that's really useful. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so it's about as useful as using Banishing Arrow. Um, the Banishing one, they can't, they for sure lose their turn if they stay, have, make their Charisma save. That being said, um, if you, uh, this one lets them choose a little bit, like, do I take the damage and move, or do I not take the damage and lose my round? Um, so it gives them a little bit more options, but, um... I think, but if you, if you hit, there's no save or anything. You have to choose one or the other. Um, and then the next option is piercing. It's not actually... So piercing is the one where you won't actually shoot the arrow first. This is the only one where you... Uh, this one and maybe the other... Uh, there's actually this one and the next one. You will uh, you will choose before shooting your arrow. Uh, because it's a, it actually has a range 30 foot in a uh, long line. And then uh, there's no attack roll. It's a deck save, and it takes the uh, basically everyone in that one line takes one d6 extra pierce damage or half. Um, actually, I don't know if it's everyone. It might be the first target. And then there's a seeking arrow as well. There's no attack roll. It's a deck save. Uh, it's a one d6 extra force damage, and I believe it can uh, hit targets that are that have cover. Um, the force damage is nice, but it's not. Um, it's only one d6 extra damage. And then the Shadow Arrow is 2d6 Psychic Damage. It's a Wisdom Save, which is a pretty good one to have. Uh, because not most al enemies don't have that high of a Wisdom Save. Uh, and then, uh, although like the Elder Brain or the whatever, the last boss might have that. So, uh, and then it gives you 5 foot of vision until the start of your next turn. Not super useful. Um... And then in 5e at level 7, Magic Arrow, your ma arrows become magical for the sake of resistances and stuff. That could be useful. And at level 7, Curving Shot, when you miss, you can use your bonus action to reroll against a new target. So, kind of like Advantage, but you have to hit a different target. Um, not as useful because normally you're going to be hitting a target that you want to hit. That being said, if you use special arrows like the one that bounces... Um, I forget what the name is, but there's there's an arrow where it, it bounces to multiple targets. Um, you can if you miss, you can try to hit someone else, and then that bouncing thing could potentially hit the target you want anyway. So it gives you double chance. That's actually very useful for specifically that arrow or other arrows that um, special arrows that um, all the spare special arrows pretty much 
other than the ones that do specific damage to certain monster types. They all have AoE um, features, so the, the fire one, the lightning one, the ice one. So it might end up being useful anyway. Um, so yeah, that, that'll give you potentially, that'll just let you not miss potentially. Uh, it uses a bonus action to reroll against a new target. Um, if you, with Arcane Archer in, in D&D 5e, you can only use longbow or short bows to, to do these arcane shots. I believe, I, I, I would say that in, um, in Baldur's Gate, they'll let you use any kind of ranged weapon, like, uh, hand crossbows, crossbows. And if they do allow hand crossbows, um, the level 7 feature will not be that that useful because you can already use your bonus action to you make an attack. It can help potentially help you save a special arrow if you are using it and then you miss. But other than that, just making the attack again could potentially be more useful because maybe the other target has higher chance to hit, uh, lower chance to hit. If that's the case, it's better to just attack again using your bonus action to the same target that's a higher chance to hit. Um, you might end up using your resources more, but that's about it. Uh, and then a uh, patch eight notes. They kind of talk about uh, doing uh, banishing enemies. So the banishing arrow is going to probably be there, and then doing some psychic damage, wisdom save, or be blinded. So I believe uh, was there. I forget if there was. There was. Uh, there, there are some arrows that do psychic damage, but it doesn't say they get blinded. So it looks like maybe they might be coming up with a new um, arcane shot or calling the or the shadow one will end up being um, a blinded uh, thing instead of five foot of vision. Oh wait, actually the five foot of vision is the blinded thing. Sorry, I forgot about, I forgot about that. The enemy that gets hit by the shadow arrow has only five foot vision until start of your next turn. Um, I was saying for some reason you gain vision of them uh, around five foot around them, but no, they actually lose vision. Uh, so they will probably become just blinded instead of five foot of vision. Um, and the, the difference being the Shadow Arrow in, in the 5e 5th edition version is uh, that they could still do melee attacks, but if they were blinded, then it would still be, they would have disadvantage on those melee attacks. Whew, lots of talking here today. Okay, so let's go to the next one. We are like 50 minutes in and <laughs> we're not even halfway through all of these subclasses, I think. Okay, let me get some water real quick. All right, so the next subclass is Monk, Way of the Drunken Master. This is a pretty fun one, uh, and I can tell you already that they might change a bunch of stuff from this. But in 5e right now, you gain a uh, bonus when you gain uh, this subclass. You gain bonus proficiencies, the performance skill, the brewer supplies, so kind of flavor stuff for the most part. Uh, at level three, you gain the drunken technique. When you use flurry of blows, you get you get uh, free disengage and ten feet of movement, so you can hit and then get out uh, without provoking attack of opportunity. And then at level six, you get tipsy sway, leap to your feet when prone, stand using only five foot of movement. So you know instead of half your movement, that's kind of use that could be useful if you want to get away from a certain place. Not super useful. The main thing be, uh, in terms of DPS is the redirect attack. When an enemy misses you, you can use one key to redirect attack within 5 feet. Uh, aside from the attacker. So that could be useful, especially if they were going to use a very powerful attack. Like Catherick, uh, when he decides to smite you and then you redirect that. But I feel like when you're fighting Catherick, he doesn't have any... Um, Aside from on when he's on top of his throne area or whatever, the ritual area, he doesn't really have um, allies near him. So maybe it's not super useful, but um, hopefully it lets you just redirect the attack. Well, it's it's when they miss, so I'm not sure exactly. And then at uh, level 11, uh, you use two key to cancel disadvantage on your uh, from yourself. Um, so that one might might stay actually. So patch eight notes they say you can drink alcohol to recover key. So that's that's not a feature that's currently in the the way of the drunken master in fifth edition. So that's potentially pretty useful because especially early on, um, monks have a super low amount of key, and then they it seems like they're adding two new uh, strikes or two new attacks. The Intoxicating Strike, you, it buffs your AC against a certain target. Um, 
uh, and you hit them, uh, it chance to hit drunken targets. So I believe what ha uh, it increases your chance to hit drunken targets if you make them drunk. So I'm guessing your first attack won't have these bonuses against them, but then once you hit them, they become drunk somehow. Uh, and then once they're drunk, uh, it's harder to hit you, and then chance to hit drunken, uh, and then uh, you have easier time hitting those drunken targets, maybe giving you advantage. And then you can also use Sobering Realization. Uh, it sobers the enemy and deals extra damage. Uh, if uh, in an ideal scenario, when you're hitting them first with an intoxicating strike, um, you would also be using Sobering Realization on the second hit, which means they're gonna be. It looks like they'll be sober now. So then they won't. There's not gonna be a bonus to your AC against them. I don't know how useful that is. That doesn't seem like a good combo. But we'll have to see what they say. Uh, a good chance for them to give you the drunkard's luck at level 11 as well. Um, looks like we don't know what level 6 feature might be. Um, the redirect attack might be what they give you. Uh, yeah. Okay. So next is the Paladin Oath of the Crown. Uh, currently in 5th edition, they also get, they let you have uh, at level 3 and 5, 9 different spells that's always prepared. So Command, Compel to Duel, Warding Bond, Zone of Truth, Aura of Vitality, and Spirit Guardian. So the key thing out of all of this here is potentially their level 9 spell. Normally, Paladins do not get Spirit Guardians. And going all uh, taking Cleric levels to get it is a little bit awkward. Um... That, but yes, if you have Spirit Guardians, that could be super useful as a Paladin. Um, and then, so and level 3, you get Channel Divinity. Uh, you can do Champion Challenge, bonus action to choose enemies that can't move more than 30 feet away from you. Or Turn the Tide, bonus action to heal 1d6 plus Charisma to all allies with less than 50% HP. So, only really useful when everyone is really weak. Uh, generally, I feel like in fights, uh, unless everyone is going down, it seems like they one person goes down and the second person goes down and the third person goes down. It's not it's not usually usual that all of your allies have lower than fifty percent HP at the time, so not super useful. Uh, potentially, if they rework this champion challenge thing so that it's more of a tank feature, you kind of keep people near you. That could be useful, and we'll get to that on the patch eight notes. And then at level 7, Divine Allegiance, when a creature within 5 foot takes damage, you use a reaction to take damage instead. That go that's another tank feature. So, Oath of the Crown is normally a very tank-oriented thing. Uh, and and what Larian says in their patch 8 notes is that you're going to have Righteous Clarity. You can taunt enemies using interrupts. So how that interrupt happens is something that we have yet, we, you know, we'll have to see. Uh... I don't know if it's going to be a soft taunt, taunt where they have disadvantage against other targets or like a hard taunt where like they can't move more than 10 feet away from you. Something like that. Uh, so that would be very useful if that could happen. And then Divine Allegiance, which is the level 7 feature, absorbing damage from, uh, from and healing allies. So not only do you absorb damage from them, but you also heal the ally. Um, but if you're taking the damage, I don't know if absorbing damage means just taking that full damage or somehow nullifying that damage by absorbing it. Um, we'll have to see. Um, especially because we want a pal this the paladin uh, will with spirit guardians is going to want to have uh, co uh, we're, is going to want to maintain concentration. Um, we're gonna have to see. Uh, exactly if you want to even take damage for allies in that way and potentially risk concentration you can potentially get concentration uh, proficiency by uh, dipping into another class before paladin and then also even getting warcaster that could end up being very useful otherwise you're gonna want to keep your spirit guardian up and doing damage um, and kind of maybe potentially just huddling with your allies if possible as well uh, the the anti synergy is you want to huddle because you want to, your uh, paladin aura to give your allies bonuses, but then if they're near you, then the enemies are gonna be able to hit you, hit your allies. So some kind of taunt to prevent that would actually be pretty useful. Uh, and then the only weakness after that is from AOE spells, but you know it is what it is. A lot of AOE spells are big enough that it'll hit lots of people anyway. So. Probably not a huge issue. 
Okay, one, one second here. <clears throat> All right, and let's jump to Ranger, the Swarm Keeper. This is gonna be a pretty fun one. Currently, uh, it's I don't think it's like a super powerful um, subclass in fifth edition. At level three, you get Gathered Swarm, which once per turn you just swarm, uh, use your swarm after an attack to um, make the target take one d six piercing damage. Target is or you could, the target is moved up to fifteen feet, so you can make them maybe fall off cliffs or whatever, or you can make yourself move five feet. Most likely, you're going to be using the first two options here, unless uh, somehow you want to disengage using this third option. So if you get yourself five feet away from them, and this is using Gather Swarm feature, so it might it's likely not going to provoke attack of opportunity, and then you can walk away using your movement. Um, that could end up being super useful. And at level three, the Swarm Keeper Magic uh, gives you the Mage Hand Cantrip, and then you can have these spells prepared: the Fairy Fire, Mage Hand. Uh, Mage Hand, uh, you, so you get it at level 3, Fairy Fire and Mage Hand, but obviously Mage Hand is a cantrip, it's not a, it's a, not a first level spell. You also get Web at level 5 and then at level 9, Cast Form, so some good control. Web is a super good control spell, uh, especially... Okay, even all the melee characters, you know, they can be equipping a ranged weapon, so that'll be pretty useful. Okay, and that level 7... In 5th edition, you get Riding, riding Tide. Uh, it's proficiency number of times per long rest, and you use your bonus action to gain flying speed and hover for one minute. Um, at level 7, this is actually pretty useful because early this early on, you do not have any fly speed for uh, usually. Um, you're not having lithid yet. That happens a little bit later, uh, or around Act 3. Or yeah, just as, just as Act 3 is starting. So this feature could be very useful. Um, and it gives you, yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. And then at level 11, I guess the one thing about the level seven feature is that you're kind of flying with your, like your swarm is keeping you afloat. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that necessarily, but Hey, maybe you like it. I don't know. Level 11, you also get a mighty swarm feature. This gathered swarm, uh, piercing which goes from 1d6 to 1d8. The failed strength save from Gather Swarm also knocks enemies prone, or when moved by the Gather Swarm, you can have cover until your next turn. So it basically buffs the Gather Swarm feature here. Um, it's not a super amazing level 11 feature, but um, knocking enemies prone could be useful, and gaining cover could be useful. Um, patch 8 notes, they actually say you're going to have three different kind of swarms. You get Cloud Jellyfish, Cloud of Jellyfish, uh, which deals lightning damage and shocks enemies. The Flurry of Moths, which does psychic damage and blinds enemies, and then Legion of Bees does piercing damage and knocks back fi uh, enemies 15 feet, and then it gives you teleportation. So um, that's all they have said so far. It looks like potentially this is just going to be their level 3 feature that they have. Um, and then I don't see why they don't give you the other level 3 features of the spells and then gain the flying speed. Uh, they might rework the level 11 thing to do a little bit more damage. Um, yeah, but so far, this stuff is pretty good. I don't know what Shock really does, but Blinded Condition and Knockback could be very useful if you want to knock them uh, over the cliff. Obviously, the disadvantage of doing that is when you knock enemies over the over an edge, you know, and they fall, um, you potentially lose all of the equipment that you wanted to get. So if you had some important uh, enemies that you were uh, fighting and you wanted their stuff, well, you're going to need, you're not going to want to use this feature. That being said, blinding an enemy could be super useful. Giving advantage and giving your allies advantage. Um, them having disadvantage attacking you. So, yeah. My throat is killing me today. Okay. And it's not just because I'm talking a lot. Cause this is not that much compared to when I stream. Okay, the rogue, they're gonna give us the swashbuckler. This is really amazing. You don't, you will not need to use any mods to get the swashbuckler for uh, getting a kind of melee focused rogue. Um, this is a really awesome subclass in general. Uh, some good kind of multi-classing uh, options potentially. So we'll look here at uh, in D&D 5e or 5th edition, we have fancy footwork at level 3. If you use a melee attack, that enemy can't make opportunity attack against you. So you can attack, back out, go in, attack, back out. Um, kind of because you're not super tanky with lots of health, 
but you're still melee. This is a very important feature to be able to go in, attack, and then come back out. And then at level three, uh, you gain rakish audacity. You can uh, you it adds very importantly charisma modifier to your initiative so that you can go attack first and then leave. And then you can also you also have additional ways to apply sneak attack. You can uh, you do not need to have advantage if you're using uh, if you're within five feet of the enemy. No other creatures are within not within within five feet of your uh, of your of itself. And then you don't have this advantage. So you can't have this advantage to proc sneak attack still. But you do not have to have uh, advantage. Now if you had advantage and you're using a ranged weapon. This would technically still apply. And um. Or if you had a feature that. Uh, I don't know if they have. Do they have crossbow expert? I'm trying to remember if that feat exists in Baldur's Gate 3. Um. Because if that's the case, you can have a ranged swashbuckler rogue that still gets sneak attack from melee. But you wouldn't really want to do that. So, um, that's not super important. And then in 5th edition, you get panache. Uh, which gives disadvantage against other target. Uh, it's the target. Uh, disadvantage against other targets other than you. <laughs> yeah. Can only make opportunity attacks against you if you use panache on someone. So it takes an action to use it on them. And then one minute or until... Uh, so it lasts for one minute or until companions attack the target. So it really becomes like a 1v1 situation there. And then if the target isn't hostile, you charm them instead. Uh, so if you do this, you can make, uh, you can make it so that the enemy doesn't have any opportunity attacks. Because obviously if you attack them... They can't, they can't make opportunity attacks against you. And then if you use panache against them, they can't use opportunity attacks against other targets other than you. So that person loses their opportunity attacks entirely, which is kind of cool, but not super important. The main thing with swashbucklers being that uh, they use the... Um, they use uh they can use sneak attacks and melee without having to have allies nearby or having advantage. Um so yeah, some cool multi-classing options there. Uh and then there's gonna be in patch eight, they said uh you can toss sand to blind enemies. So I don't I, I don't know if that's gonna be like a level nine feature. Um because I you can also flick weapons to disarm them. Uh, and then fancy footwork, no opportunity attacks attack against you. So this is remaining. Uh, and rakish audacity is also a very core feature of swashbucklers. I doubt they're going to rework that because this is the main thing about them. So potentially they give you another level three feature, but that will be very front loaded uh, uh, subclass here. If you if they give you all of this plus tossing sand and plus flicking weapons. So p potentially what they do is their panache feature gonna change to tossing sand. Uh, and then flicking weapons to disarm them, probably as as bonus actions. So that could be pretty useful to give you advantage or to cancel out this the disadvantage. Okay, now sorcerer shadow magic is going to be the subclass that they give you in fifth edition currently. Uh, at level one, that you get eyes of the dark, which is superior dark vision. It's a hundred feet of it. Uh, so a little better than regular dark vision and at level three learn the darkness spell and you can use two sorcery points to gain vision in that darkness spell so uh not only to you have vision but to cast you use two sorcery points to cast uh darkness which is a really good way to gain advantage and cause disadvantage that being said your allies won't be able to see in there so you'll you'll be in there by yourself unless your allies also have some sort of uh darkness vision uh not not dark vision magical dark vision mean you know so either if you have warlocks in your uh in your party and things like that which will end up coming up later so we'll see that uh, you can potentially create parties full of uh, shadow magic sorcerers and uh, and warlocks because they also get eldritch. Uh, I forget what the feature is called. Eldritch sight, I think. Yeah. Okay, and then at level one, you also get strength of the grave. So once per long rest, if you're about to um, 
if, if you're about to go down, you can use a Charisma save to get to 1 HP. And the only issue is if you can't uh, use it if you're hit by Radiant or Critical Hit. So that's going to be some part of the uh, attacks, but not too much. The enemies aren't really using Radiant attacks against you. Uh, and there's going to be some crits, but not too much. Okay, and at level 6, you get Hound of Ill Omen. You use your bonus action and uh, 3 sorcery points to summon a Hound. It's going to have the Dire Wolf stats. It has medium size, and it's not a beast, it's a monstrosity. And um, it's going to have temporary HP equal to half of your sorcerer level. So I believe that means it has Dire Wolf's uh, HP plus half of your sorcerer level. So just pads a little bit more HP. It can move through objects, so it doesn't have to go around things. But when it is going through objects, it has half the speed, I believe. And then it use it, you can use its uh it can use its action to attack a target. Uh, it can also use opportunity attacks. And if it is with five foot of the target, the target has disadvantage against your spell saves. So this could be really good if you wanted to use some sort of control spell to make them uh, or another or a, an attack spell that requires spell saves. Um, and it makes so you want them to get hit. It's like giving yourself advantage basically um, And then in patch 8 notes, it says you can get superior dark vision So it looks like that'll remain strength of the grave resisting death looks like will remain uh, There's a very good chance with superior dark vision They're going to also let you have this uh, cast dark uh, darkness with two sorcery points and have uh, Darkness vision or they'll just give you dark vision that has that lets you see it in magical darkness they also say use there you you can use Hound of Ill Omen to harass foes. So it looks like this feature will stay probably mostly the same. I don't see why you wouldn't keep it a, pretty much the same. And then they're also gonna give you Shadow Walk, teleport between dim areas or dark areas. Um, yeah, I don't know how they're gonna when they're gonna give you the Shadow Walk feature. Um, yeah, I can't really think of when because there's not supposed to uh, another feature you gain as sorcerer until level 14, but we only have to level 12. Um, yeah, but maybe it'll just be early on and they just give you free teleports, which seems a little bit weird because sorcerers can already um, do misty step and such. But yeah, potentially you can be teleporting within the darkness spell area. That could be cool. Okay, the Warlocks are going to get the Hexblade. Yes, we are not going to need to mod to get the Hexblade anymore. And Hexblade is very easily uh, translatable to uh, game mechanics. So we'll see exactly what happens here. Give me one second. Okay, so currently, when you uh, became a, become a Hexblade at level 1, or when as a Hexblade, you can have... All of these spells uh, added to your Warlock list, and you can choose to learn them. So you can choose Shield, which is very powerful. Uh, so the one tricky thing about Warlocks is they don't get a lot of spell slots. So using Shield with your Warlock spells is not that great, but it can save your life. If you need to, you need to. So that's really great. And then there's Wrathful Smite. Um, which doesn't scale with levels, so probably not going to be super useful. Um, I believe all the other smites in this section do scale with uh, spell level. And then uh, you can also you also get a, a second level second level spell. You get blur and branding smite added, so branding smite could be useful. Third level, you get blink and elemental uh, weapon. Blink is not blink is a useful spell in general, but if you are using a 5th level spell slot to use blink, it's not super great. Um, yeah, and then you can use elemental weapon for uh, to give uh, magical properties and uh, use it to uh, exploit some vulnerabilities. And then in 4th spell, you get the Phantasmal Killer and Staggering Smite. Pretty useful. Uh, not much to say there and then in fifth uh, level there's banishing smite which is actually very useful it does take up your concentration in fact most of these do and then cone of cold but most importantly at level one hexblade warlocks gain the hexblade curse feature and the hex warrior feature you use your bonus action to curse an enemy for one minute you can add your proficiency to the damage 
Uh, it lets you crit with a lower roll, so 19 or 20, unless you have other things. They all seem to stack in Baldur's Gate. And then after you kill, you will heal. Kill an enemy, you will be able to heal. Warlock level plus Charisma modifier. And then again at level 1, you also gain Hex Warrior, which means you gain proficiency in medium armor, shields, martial weapons. Obviously because you want to be going to melee if you don't have any uh, of these, it's pretty risky. And then you can bind to a weapon to use Charisma to attack. So that's the one of the main most important thing. That being said, this feature, they're pro probably going to level 1, but you also get it at level 3 when you get packed with the weapon. So it's something that you were you were already going to get. Maybe potentially um, what they do is they let you upgrade something even more at level 3 instead of just being able to use it on two-handed or ranged weapons. Um, yeah. Uh, but if, you, if they give you this feature at level 1, you'll be able to do some Hexblade dips. One level dip in Hexblade to be able to cast these things. And then at level 6, you get the Accursed Spectre. It's once per long rest. After you kill, you can summon a Spectre and you and then uh, their temporary HP is half of your Warlock level. And then at level 10, you get Armor of Hexes, which is really useful. The enemy has 50% chance to miss. Basically, they roll a d6 um, once they, when they're attacking you. And then if it's, you know, I forget 1 through 3, they miss. Or 4 through 6, I forget. One or the other. But it's basically 50% chance to miss you. On top of the regular chance to miss you, so that's actually pretty useful. Gives you lots of more, uh, lots more defenses without having to necessarily use shield. Um, and in patch eight notes, and uh, Larian says that you can curse enemies, which is the Hexblade's curse feature, sounds like, and then raise spirits for ten turns, rip enemy souls to heal summoner. So maybe what they're gonna do is the curses a uh, cursed specter feature lets you summon them and then heals you or something like that so or actually though it's i, I remember now the the rips enemy soul is the ray the ray spirit the cursed specter when it attacks it can heal the summoner um which could be useful um any healing is is good if you have it but it's better to just not get hit in my opinion uh, so I don't know exactly how useful that will be, but yeah, in a long battle, you are likely to take some damage, so that's what will happen. Uh, and then finally, we have the Wizard School of Blade Singing. They're giving us so many spell blade options. We don't have to use mods to do these. Um, currently at level 2 uh, in 5th edition, you get training in Warsong, you get proficiency in light armor, one-handed melee weapon of your choice, and a per the performance skill. Uh, I I hope that uh, they give you proficiency in all uh, one-handed melee weapons just because there's so many different magical weapons in uh, BG3 and you're gonna want to swap them or have or you find a better one that you'll use. Um, so having more proficiency would be a little bit better. Um, and then at level 2 you get the blade song feature. You can use the proficiency times per long rest. Um, if you're not wearing medium armor medium or heavier armor or using a shield you can cast it as a bonus action we all you know we know this feature pretty well i think uh, especially if you've been to my streams you know that i've used the blade singing uh mod and finished the run you get bonus ac plus in, uh plus intel's modifier you get 10 uh feet movement you get advantage on acrobatics and bonus on concentration saves uh with your intelligence modifier so you can keep your concentration pretty well if you have uh, if you are a blade singing wizard, and then at level six you get an extra, uh, you get a special extra attack where you can attack one attack, and then the second attack can be replaced with a cantrip. Um, and I hope that they add attack uh, different uh, blade cantrips. Otherwise, this is not as useful. But um, I would say if they're adding blade singing, if they're adding hex blades, that they're going to add those uh, like green flame blade and uh, the other blade cantrip so that you can cast those things otherwise it's not as useful um that being said it can it's still useful to be able to use a cantrip if you need um and then at level 10 you get the song def defense where you can use a spell slot to defend uh to reduce the damage to take by five times the spell slot level uh about that yes five times the spell slot level damage okay 
And what they tell us about blade singing is, um, is that new spell casting animations using the sword, so that's kind of cool. Um, blade song, you get gain speed, agility, focus, and con save. So speed is the movement part. Agility is probably the advantage on the acrobatic save. Focus is probably being um, uh, what is it? The bonus to uh, armor class. You have the extra focus to dodge more, maybe. And then con save bonus being this one. So all of the blade song features. Um, and I don't see why they wouldn't give you the extra attack feature. That is one of the main things as well of Blade Singing Wizards. Um, and so I think everything's going to stay pretty much the same, which is probably why they didn't say much about what's coming. I think it's going to stay pretty much the same. The only thing I would say Larian should do is change it so that you don't only get one uh, proficiency in one-handed we melee weapon, but you get proficiency in all one-handed melee weapons. Um, okay, so now we'll talk about some multi-classing. So I have a list of multi-class options here that I've come up with, kind of can, can guess. Um, so Path of the Giants, Barbian, Barbarian 3 plus, mar plus a martial class, like a fighter, a monk, ranger, paladin. That's going to be super huge, especially if you get that extra strength. Um, especially if you can get that up to like 26, 27 strength, that's going to be very, very big. Uh, that's going to be a very big common uh, combo there. And then the College of Glamour Bard 6 plus Shadow Sorcerer. Um, so you can use your Hound of Ill Omen to cause a disadvantage. And then keep using control spells to make them all lose control. Uh, that, for them to all have disadvantage on their wisdom saving throws. That could be very big in terms of battlefield control. Um, in terms of the Death Domain Cleric. The only thing I could really come up with was like 2 levels on Paladin and a Death Domain Cleric. So that you can have the extra big damage once you do make that hit. Um, you're not really going to get a lot of attacks. So I don't know how useful that's going to be. But that's about all I could really come up with for the Death Domain Cleric. Um, for the Circle of Stars Druid. You can pot potentially do 2 levels in it. Um... And then uh, that'll give you weaponized range, bonus action, uh, or maintain concentration. So you can use that to kind of, if you want a weaponized bonus action, get two levels in Circle of Stars Druid. Um, that's not really, that's like a, just a multi-classing just uh, tip in general. I don't know, you know, fit it with whatever you want. There's a bunch of classes that don't get that, so. Um, and then a War Domain Cleric 2 plus uh, Circle of Stars Druid. So that's one of those kind of one combination uh, where you can get two attacks potentially or you can uh, use um, yeah you can try to make your melee attack to use your channel divinity and then you can also use the ranged attack from the circle of stars druid because clerics cannot you know if you're a war domain cleric you can't dip into war cleric obviously okay and then you can, any rogue but slosh buckler 4 or 5 plus the arcane archer fighter um, you can potentially use that to have some extra damage sneak attacks and to hide every uh, every turn so that you can have advantage kind of a just ranger type of long range ar uh, you know archery type of uh, attack with a little bit of extra flair using the arcane archer fighter you know arcane arrow arcane shot features so that'll be kind of interesting. And then uh, the next one is Barbarian 2 or 3 plus the Way of Drunken Master Monk. So just giving you yourself that raging, uh, kind of fun raging drunken monk. Kind of an option where you have you're like have extra resistance to damage. You have advantage on all your attacks. Um, yeah, so it's probably going to be two levels, but three levels could be... Something that you consider because you could take Path of the Giants and have extra strength if you're using Tavern Dollar. You can have, uh, if if their feature adds strength, it's not as useful as opposed to if it sets your strength to 26 or 27. So it'll really depend on what happens when the patch uh, drops and we have more information. We'll see if I do more another video to see, um, to kind of do more combinations like if I can think of them. Um, and then, oh, yeah, so next one, we have the Shadow slash Draconic Sorcerer 1 plus Hexblade 1 plus Oath of Crown Paladin. This is, uh, this is a pretty classic combo. You can get a uh, Constitution saving throw um, from taking a Sorcerer level. And then you can use, uh, you can take one dip in Hexblade to get, to attack with, uh, your, uh, with your Charisma. And then use Oath of Crown Paladin 
to rest of the way to get that tanky option there. You can have Spirit Guardians up, use Charisma to attack. Can be very sad, which is single ability score dependent. Use Charisma to attack, have Constitution for your de defense, have heavy armor, all that stuff. Actually, you only have medium armor at this point, but uh, I think it's worth the, the trade-off for the Constitution staying through. And then one option I thought of was taking either one level Sorcerer, Rogue, or Wizard, plus the Swarm Keeper Ranger. Um, just so that you can get uh, either you can get either Constitution saving throw or get a uh, extra spell, um, or just be able to have that Rogue One feature, um, not like a super crazy thing, uh, but looks like Swarm Keeper. It it might be better to stay Swarm Keeper if you're going to be a Swarm Keeper Ranger. As a swashbuckler, a uh, very classic combo, you can have one or five levels of Hexblade. Not one to five, but one or five so that you can either just have that one level dip um, so that you can use Charisma uh, to attack, or you can have five levels so that you can get um, extra attack. And so that, that way you can get two or three attacks per round and have some swashbuckler stuff for the sneak attack. And you can also, when you sneak attack or crit, you can... Yeah, no, actually not when you sneak attack, but when you crit, you can add your sneak attack plus you can smite them. That'll be super useful. Okay, and then at Sorcerer 1, uh, uh, no, not at Sorcerer 1, uh, for Hexblades, you can do one level of Sorcerer for that, um, for that Constitution saving throw, and then take 11 levels of Hexblade. You can potentially add one more level in Wizard or something if you want to try that because you... But six, uh, 11 levels will be good because you get a 6 level spell, the Mystic Arcanum. So Hexblade, pretty much a good class just to go straight if you want. Um, but one level in Wizard will be good. It gets you some level 1 spells for that shield spell instead of having to use your Warlock spells for that. That'll be super useful. And then, if you go Blade Singing, you've seen me do this in my runs. Uh, one level in Sorcerer for the Constitution Saving Throw, two levels in Paladin for the Smite, and the rest of the way, Blade Singing Wizard, so that you can do some of that. You can have high-level spell slots, um, and you can be smiting with your attacks, all that good stuff. So that is, those are all the multiclassing options uh, that I've come up with so far. Um, Maybe if I, uh, during my streams, I can discuss more if you have any questions. If you, you can hop on my stream at twitch.tv slash Junita. Um, or I may make another video when we have more information. So we shall see um, what happens there. But that is it for this video. Hope everyone got to learn something today. Or at least um, we're able to use this to get some information without having to... Go and read everything. The video was longer than having to read the whole thing, but you get some extra context and explanation. Hope everyone has a wonderful day. Please like, comment, and subscribe to help me out. And uh, if you want more information, drink, you pop in my streams to, to, and ask some questions. 